Let's answer one of the biggest cliffhanger questions to have ever been posed in One Piece. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. And today we have a bit of an extended discussion to have regarding the events of chapter 1007 and specifically the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Odin thing. So if you're an anime only watcher who has stumbled upon this video, then hello, great to see you. But you may want to go somewhere else to avoid being spoiled, like uh, this video being suggested to you, for example. Lots and lots of fun to be had there without spoiling your enjoyment of this wonderful series. But why am I doing this though? Things seem to have been pretty well covered in my chapter review, but as is the nature of such content, there's quite a bit about the situation that I happen to miss, some very important and potentially perspective altering stuff as well, which is always going to happen. Reviews are very time sensitive affairs, and I don't always have the opportunity to whip out the microscope and write an empirical thesis about every single event. But now with the luxury of time, this video is going to be a much deeper dive into the question of whether or not this is in fact Kozuki Odin. And it will also address a lot of ideas and concerns that I found in the comments section of the review. But first, it's time for a quick round of Odin or Nodin, a very simple mini game, the rules of which are as follows. Here we have a poneglyph, and it is going to be your job to guess if behind this poneglyph is Odin or not Odin, also known as Nodin. And should you guess incorrectly, then your punishment will be to subscribe to the Grand Line Review, which will also result in consistent injections of One Piece culture administered straight into your YouTube feed. And if you do guess correctly, then you will be awarded a pot of Odin. But what will it be? Odin or Nodin? Please do select your choice now and we shall reveal the answer in three, two, one, and bam, it's uh, it's been Book of the Teapot. So that's a definite Nodin. And if you guessed incorrectly, then you know the thing to do and please do say hi in the comments below if you are a new member of the Grand Fleet. Welcome. And to begin, I want to immediately debunk one train of thought, which is that this figure is Higurashi. Now, if you don't remember Higurashi's name, then uh, that's fine. She's probably better known as the old hag anyway, but it did quite legitimately surprise me just how many people stated that this had to be her, when in reality, she is probably one of the only characters in the series who it is guaranteed not to be. If you're a very casual reader or watcher of One Piece, then I guess I don't blame you because it can be tricky to put all of these pieces together, but Higurashi was able to shapeshift thanks to the Mane Mane no Mi, a devil fruit now possessed by Bon Clay in the modern day. So due to the very fact that Bon Clay has this ability, that confirms that Higurashi is dead, along with Kaido's words during Odin's execution when he stated that he had killed her for interrupting their fight. So it is definitely not the old hag. Next up, there's also an incredibly popular thought thread that this Odin is in fact Katarina Devon of the Blackbeard Pirates, wielding her ability of the Inu Inu no Mi model Kitsune. Now I did briefly address this in the review, but I was quite dismissive of it and I probably didn't make the reasoning why clear enough because there are several reasons why I don't think it's Devon. The primary one being that Blackbeard's focus is not on Wano. The last we'd heard from him comes from chapter 956, where we have the following very vague statement. Pack your bags onto the ship. If the Navy's going to take it, I might as well claim the prize. Heavily implying that he is currently directly challenging the Marines for whatever they're after. And this could be literally anything, a poneglyph, an ancient weapon, a devil fruit, whatever. But whatever it is, we know it's not on Wano. Because a conversation between Fujitora and Sakazuki in chapter 957 about the alliance between Big Mom and Kaido sees the fleet admiral state the following. And at a time when we're too busy to do anything else, it's just just the latest disaster, which is Sakazuki clearly stating that the Marines have no time or resources to focus on Wano, which means that whatever Blackbeard is competing with them for is also not on Wano. And yeah, I know a lot of fans like to speculate that Blackbeard will stroll in at the last second to deal the final blow to Kaido and take his devil fruit, which is thought by us and us alone to be the strongest of the Zoans, and also road poneglyph issues and whatnot. But I think that's very wishful thinking, just like the whole revolutionary army on Wano idea. These are things playing out in the background setting us up for the next saga, not necessarily this one. Now, with that said, there is a possibility that this is Devon acting alone, sort of like Jesus Burgess during the Dress Rosa arc, but I have problems with that as well. One of which being despite the fact that she could conceivably know what Odin looks like, due mostly to the fact that Blackbeard spent a couple of years sailing with him, Devon would still have no knowledge of his relationship with the vassals, aside from Izo, Nekomamushi, and Inorashi. But even with those three, this facade would break almost immediately. Now, one thing I should point out is that many have compared Odin's pose to that of Katarina Devon's, it's quite a subtle thing, but this Odin and Devon both put their hands on their hips with their wrists and palms facing outwards. And that seems like a pretty wild Devon confirmed connection at first, because I really don't know anyone in real life who uses this as a casual resting pose. If you do, then please let me know in the comments down below. You're weird. 
please stop. But this pose is not all that uncommon in One Piece. For example, here's a shot of Kinemon doing the palm facing outwards pose, and here's young Vista doing the exact same pose with both arms. And you know what? Look, even Odin has done it himself in the past, so this is not a characteristic that is either exclusive to Kateri and Devon or out of character for Odin. So maybe, just maybe, let's not read too, too much into the whole pose thing. Really, the only logical argument I can come up with for why Blackbeard would even send Devon in would be to find the road Poneglyph. But even then, if that was your mission, why draw attention to herself pretending to be the one person who absolutely 100% should not be here? It just doesn't quite click. Furthermore, if this is Devon, then it also doesn't solve the crying silhouette mystery. That's something that I think many people have pushed into the back of their minds after this whole Odin reveal, but this silhouette did not belong to Odin or Odin's body. Nor does it belong to Katarina Devon because she has a, a very distinct facial shape, shall we say? Unless she was pretending to be someone else, in which case, why is she crying? And uh, look, the whole thing doesn't even come close to adding up. So with that in mind, here's a comment from Antonio Martinez. Five dollars, it's the woman from the Blackbeard Pirates with the ability to change her appearance. Why? I don't know. So sure, I will take that bet, Antonio. If this is Katarina Devon, I will legit PayPal you five dollary dues because this is one piece and anything can happen. But right now I do feel like this is a pretty safe bet for me. Now, the interesting thing about solving this mystery is it's not just about coming up with any given character who has the power to conjure or even become the image of someone else because this silhouette is a very, very important factor at play here. And right now I really do only have one answer that satisfies both of these criteria without the figure actually being Odin and that is Onimaru. I brought him up in the chapter review, but this is where I actually missed something potentially important because on the final page of Odin's reveal, you can see that he is surrounded by smoke on the floor. And this smoke on the floor is very similar to that generated whenever Onimaru transforms into the Yukimaru figure and transforms back into being a delightful fox. This is something that I didn't notice because I was far too busy looking at the figure of Odin himself and trying to dissect any potential differences and clues. But this might be a classical sleight of hand trick being played by Oda, catching our eye with the more attention grabbing figure, only to have the true magic playing around down here. Now with that said, like the Katarina Devon pose, I think that this could also just be reading into things far too much. This could be a very simple aesthetic device being employed by Oda to give the panel some more depth and even focus. The idea being that it makes the panel more interesting and detailed than simply seeing a flat floor and even adds a sense of epicness to a character being revealed in this, quite frankly, theatrical manner. And for some other examples of that, I took a very casual look back through the manga and here you can see that in Speed's reintroduction, she is surrounded by smoke around her legs and with Robin's phenomenal full body shot after slapping Black Maria, she is also framed by smoke around her feet. And look, even this group shot of the Toby Roper from behind has their feet being framed by smoke in the foreground. So basically, yes, this is a potentially interesting parallel to Onimaru's transformation, but smoke on its own should not be taken as this like grand piece of foreshadowing. However, what I do think enhances the argument for the Onimaru solution is that it would provide an answer to our silhouette. I didn't mention this in my chapter review because quite frankly, I forgot, but the very last place we saw Kozuki Hyori was in Ringo during chapter 955. It was a brief flashback of her refusing to join the allied forces for her, um, uh, her weird reasons, but this very potentially places Hiyori with Onimaru, who was also last seen in Ringo. So at the very least, that would satisfy both of our questions here. The figure of Odin being a transformed Onimaru and Hiyori being the crying silhouette. And what's more is that Hiyori would still kind of be keeping her word. I dismissed it very casually earlier, but she said she would refrain from meeting the others because sentiment is forbidden before battle. So tending to them while they were unconscious still very much sort of keeps that intent alive. So I'm actually feeling pretty good about this as a more skeptic solution. The only question I still have is why Odin? Whose bright idea was it to have Onimaru transform into Odin and what purpose does it serve to deceive the vassals like this? As well as to once again, draw incredible amounts of attention to yourself by impersonating the one figure whose very face would see anyone seeing it into pure shock. And there's also the question surrounding if Onimaru can transform into more than one figure. And if so, can he do it without keeping the trademark swirly eyebrows that do carry over into the Yukimaru form? Because the thing about Onimaru that we haven't touched on is his powers are almost certainly devil fruit related. Magical shape-shifting creatures, well, they just don't really exist in one piece and almost everything has a devil fruit related explanation. And with that fruit surely comes limitations and I just don't know if Oda would create a third power that allows users to mimic others. But all of that is pure speculation. Regardless, I do think it's one of the better explanations to this whole Odin problem. Next up, let's talk about the Kanjuro theory a bit more. The idea being that Kanjuro is alive and would be capable of 
crafting a picture-perfect Odin thanks to his Devil Fruit abilities. And I think it's a fine enough idea and it does sort of answer the lingering question I did have with Onimaru, which is why Odin? Because if Kandra was, for whatever reason, genuinely trying to assist the vassals, then why not create the most powerful thing he can think of? That thing, obviously, being Odin. He's also kind of confusing and just twisted enough to very much defy reason. There wouldn't necessarily need to be a logically sound purpose for Kandra creating an Odin. And if anything, it may even open up some interesting potential if he were to draw multiple Odins and kind of finds himself having just like a mental breakdown at the sight of an army of Odins. Although come to think of it, what would the collective noun be for a group of Odins? Because I'm going to say it's a pot. A pot of Odin. Now, many people in the comments also brought up Kandro's anticlimactic death, citing it as evidence that he still has some sort of future purpose that could be being enacted right in front of our eyeballs. And as much as I would personally like him to, that also may not necessarily be the case. It does feel very anticlimactic, but the more you read into the situation, the more that that kind of seems like the entire point behind his death. For those who don't know, Kandro was an actor and he was raised in a theater troupe and his design is even based on a traditional kabuki performer. And the whole concept behind his death is that the worst possible fate for an actor would be to die off stage because it means that their character does not get to milk that delicious, delicious drama. So in many ways, yeah, it is quite deserving and appropriate for his betrayal, although not overly satisfying for us as readers. So I wouldn't use the whole death thing as clear reasoning as to why Kandro must return. And the bigger problem is that a Kandro related solution does not solve our silhouette. Well, I mean, unless Kandro also decided to draw Lady Toki as well. It wouldn't be Hiori because Kandro didn't get to meet modern day Hiori, but that would be pretty interesting actually, now that I think about it a bit more. The idea of Kandro just going, yeah, you know what this situation needs to become even more chaotic? A copy of the dead Odin and Toki just running around and freaking everyone the F out. But the only thing with that is if this Odin was Kandro's drawing, then why would he draw him without his swords? And here's another thing I was quite shocked at. An awful lot of people looked at the two swords that Odin is carrying and said that they definitely were Enma and the Ame no Habakiri. And also they use that as the reasoning why this could not be Odin because the real Enma is obviously with Zoro. But this, uh, this is just an oversight because these are definitely not Enma or the Ame no Habakiri. What Odin is carrying appears to be far more generic in nature, which I don't get why Kandro would do. Surely you would just give Odin, Odin swords, unless he's chosen to take a bizarre degree of artistic license in this very minor area. Onimaru, on the other hand, would be forced to use whatever weapons were available to him, so I think that only adds evidence to his idea. But then there's a theory that we haven't gone into yet. The idea that this is indeed Odin. And I know that's not a, <laughs> it's not a popular thought. In fact, I did a poll on my channel after the chapter came out, and yes, most of you are definitely in the fake Odin camp. Although I would say that some of you might be there for the wrong reasons. Reading through my comments, I got the distinct impression that many, many people thought this was implying that Odin had either survived his execution or that he had been resurrected. And this at the very least is never what I was implying when I spoke about the idea that this is actually Odin. The thought is more along the lines that he traveled into the future prior to facing Kaido and getting executed, then traveled back. And we'll expand on that in a bit. But to address some brief concerns, several of you brought up that it can't be Odin because his body should have burns due to the rather brutal method of execution. And I definitely agree. This cannot be Odin any time after he got into the pot. In fact, I'd even argue that it can't be Odin any time after his clash with Kaido due to the very visible injuries. And also, I'll be clear right here and now, if this is Odin after somehow surviving the execution, I will flip a table. That kind of twist would be worse than any fake out death that Oda has written so far. Worse than even Pell surviving the Alabaster Bomb. It would ruin Odin's legacy, it would ruin any drama evoked in the flashback, and it would probably go down in history as the worst thing to have ever happened in One Piece. Which is why the only solution I currently see for this to actually be Odin is to invoke time travel. For Toki to have sent Odin into to the future before his execution, where he sees and is even potentially involved in the events of Wano yet to play out. However, afterwards, he would need to tragically travel back in time to undergo his execution in order to make sure that these events actually occur. So there's actually some pretty great dramatic potential in that. As well as giving us some key answers regarding things like why Odin was able to tell Toki for a fact that 20 years from now, there will be a group of individuals capable of bringing down Kaido. But the whole problem here lies in time travel as we understand it in One Piece, being that Toki can only use her ability to travel forward. And even if she could send people back in time through an awakening or just a further mastery of fruit abilities, that would mean that Toki would also need to be here in the present day so that she's ultimately able to send Odin back. Which, 
okay, Toki's physique does indeed match our mysterious silhouette, so there is that. But things are getting complicated, very complicated as they often do with time travel, although it is not impossible for a competent author to deal with. And if you do want to know some more specifics about the time travel idea, then please do check out the chapter review of 1007. I don't just wanna rehash it here because that's a waste of your time. But I am quite keen on it because this whole time travel thread still has yet to truly pay off. Yes, Toki sent Kinemon's group into the future, which was integral, but so much about her and her abilities have been left completely unexplained. One might say almost intentionally ignored. As well as how this entire scenario played out, like why did she selectively send Momonosuke and Kinemon into the future, but not Hiyori and Kawamatsu? I mean, all of them were there. Unless Toki had been to the future and knew that Kawamatsu and Hiyori had to take the long way around for pivotal one or freeing reasons. As well as why Toki herself didn't just jump forward 20 years considering Odin told her that's where her goal was. And yeah, yeah, remember the whole the scar thing? The scar that was weirdly conveniently pointed out on Toki's leg that was just never referenced again. Yet at the same time was clear seeding for some sort of grand future revelation. Look, yeah, there's a lot of question marks surrounding Toki and time travel left to be resolved. So from my perspective, that leaves this whole situation very open for an explanation to do with time travel. Although for that to be the case, you would also assume that Odin has his swords, which he definitely does not. So that's a bit of a problem and one that I haven't quite worked out. What I will say is that we are treading a very thin line with this reveal. Whether this is Odin or not, things could go very wrong very easily. And if I were more of a nihilist, I'd say that there was no good way out of this situation. Either it's not Odin and the cliffhanger was designed to be a deliberate tease with some sort of technical Onimaru Kondro-esque explanation, thus resulting in a polite nod of, yes, that makes sense, even if it was a bit disappointing. Thank you for the bait, Oda. Or it is Odin and we've got, well, we've got some hardcore explaining to do. And nothing I've said here accounts for all of the potential unknowns. For example, in the comments of the review, I saw all sorts of crazy ideas proposed, like perhaps this incarnation of Odin is a Haki-esque force ghost that may have been released with Zoro wielding Enma. Or even that the vassals are all undergoing some sort of mass hallucination and are actually seeing Yamato or something, which look, it's creative thinking. I like it, but it's very much on the wrong track, especially since Yamato is in the polar opposite location to them. And hey, this could also be a completely new devil fruit ability, perhaps one wielded by Hiori that somehow allows conjuring of an image of Odin without his swords, which is, I mean, man, that sword factor is just what really throws a lot of these ideas completely out of whack. Whether it's Kondro's ink, Toki's time traveling, or any number of left field options, the fact that Odin does not have his swords is a very puzzling feature. And it leaves me thinking that the Onimaru explanation is probably the best one. Oh, and just because I didn't specifically address it earlier, it's also definitely not Bon Clay or another user of the Mane Mane no Mi. Bon Clay is currently alive and impelled down with no knowledge of Odin or Wano whatsoever, much less the ability to touch Odin and take his physique. So just getting that in there before all of the uh, Bon Clay comments appear. In essence though, what I think and what I hope are two very different things. I legitimately hope that this is Odin and I hope that Oda has a great explanation surrounding his presence and begins to pay off this Toki time travel power thread. I think it would be an incredible twist to be fighting alongside Odin in this conflict against Kaido and a true X factor that might finally explain how we are ultimately going to be able to overcome two of the four emperors. With that said, my brain won't allow me to fully invest in that idea because there are too many much simpler explanations available, even if none of them fit particularly perfectly. But if you'd like to examine some more crackpot ideas, then please do feel free to check out the One Piece Crazy Theories playlist. Lots of wild ideas, so I look forward to seeing you there.